everyone, it's Katrina. Elongated skulls. One of the most curious cultural coincidences from around the world is that elite ancient people would bind their skulls. Archaeologists in South Korea recently discovered an elongated skull very similar to those found in Mexico, Peru, and Europe. It seems the cultural phenomenon of purposely mutilating the human skull to make it longer and more prominent was more widespread than previously thought. The elongated skull was found inside an ancient Korean coffin from the 6th century and belonged to a woman. By analyzing the bones, researchers were able to figure out the woman died sometime in her late 30s and had been part of the Silla Kingdom, the dynasty that ruled all of the Korean peninsula from between 57 BC to until the year 935 AD. They also looked at the carbon isotopes in her bones to see that she had eaten mostly a vegetarian diet of wheat and rice. This is thought to be evidence of the Buddhist influence in the ancient Silla Kingdom. But the weird coincidence here is that she had a skull like an alien. It's hard to believe that the practice of cranial deformation somehow spread from ancient Peru all the way to the Korean peninsula. It literally doesn't make any sense, since these two cultures never had any contact with one another. So why did so many cultures from the past believe in the need for these large skulls? It was a complicated process that had to be started practically from birth, and could have dangerous side effects. Why did societies value this type of head shape? And why would this group want to stand out from the rest of their people? For many, the easy explanation is that they learned the practice from an outside source that contacted them. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below! I am excited to announce that this video is sponsored by Established Titles. This is an exciting project and an amazing gift idea. You can get some land, help the environment, support your favorite YouTuber, all while becoming a lord or lady in the process. What you do is buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. And in exchange, you will receive the official title of Lord or Lady and an official frame certificate with a crest and a tree planted in your name. Established Titles is a fun and unique way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. It is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. You could change your name to add lord or lady and get it on your credit cards, plane tickets. The possibilities are endless. And of course, you can be sure to remind your friends and family to call you by your proper title. You can also get a gift pack for a couple that comes with adjoining plots of land. Your certificate will feature a unique plot number where you can see the exact location of your land. But here's the best part. Established Titles has let us know that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. We can start our real-life Origins Explained Kingdom. So remember, this makes an amazing last-minute gift or a great gift for people who have everything. Established Titles is actually running a Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code Origins Explain, you get an additional 10% off. Go to www.establishedtitles.com slash Origins Explained to get your gifts now and help support the channel. The Third Eye The Third Eye has a long history in India and Asia, everywhere that Buddhism and Taoism has spread. Evidence of a third eye can be seen in sculptures and paintings all across Asia and the Indian subcontinent. According to modern spiritualists, the third eye is an ancient power that every person possesses, and ancient cultures have known about it and believed in it for thousands of years. The third eye is accessible by any person and can endow them with a higher consciousness, a greater perception of the world around them, and even in some rare cases, clairvoyance. But of course, the exact definition of the third eye varies depending on which spiritualist you are talking to. Still, the third eye can be found in all Eastern religions, even Hinduism. It's clearly marked in statues by a dot in the middle of the forehead, and it's honestly quite hard to miss. But here's where things get a little strange. Archaeologists and historians have all but ignored the blatant proof that Mesoamericans knew just as much about the third eye as the people in Asia. Cultures like the Maya, the Olmec, the Aztec, and even the Inca knew about the third eye and incorporated it into their artwork and sculptures. It looks a little different than in the eastern part of the world, but a very distinct circular shape can be seen in the middle of the forehead on funerary masks, statues of gods, and on the giant head sculptures left behind by the extremely mysterious Olmec people. Richard Cassaro, who loves to study these types of coincidences, is wondering why historians seem to have ignored this. 
but the coincidence is there for anyone to see. Hand Motifs Paintings and symbols of hand motifs have been sighted almost everywhere in the world. Most are upwards of 10,000 years old, likely created by the most ancient people on Earth. But what's really strange is that almost all the hand motifs found in cave art around the globe are nearly identical. Hand paintings have been made in a variety of ways, such as with stencils, with paint sprayed from the mouth, with charcoal powder, or with paints and brushes. Still, the results are eerily similar, with the handprints of men, women, and children being found on prehistoric cave walls from France to Argentina. What anthropologists can't figure out is the significance behind the motifs. Why did basically every branch of humanity decide to paint their hands on cave walls? Did it have something to do with a mysterious ancient ritual? Is it all just a coincidence? We have no definitive answers. And here is another bizarre part of the mystery. Many hand paintings have been found with a missing finger. In other words, whoever made the cave paintings was either missing one of their fingers or chose not to put it. Whole groups of people with just three fingers and a thumb have been leaving their handprints on the rock. Experts have guessed that it could be some type of sign language or symbolism. Other experts believe some primitive people were mutilating themselves on purpose by cutting off one of their fingers as part of a gruesome ceremony. The Chinese Sphinx There is a crazy historical theory floating around that China was created by a group of Egyptian migrants thousands of years ago. The theory says the Egyptians, or at least the great descendants of Egyptians, made their way to China and brought with them some of their culture, which gradually morphed into ancient Chinese culture. There isn't much proof of this, other than some pretty strange coincidences. For example, an ancient tomb in northwest China has revealed a sphinx carved from marble that looks incredibly similar to the famous sphinx in front of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The cemetery was uncovered on what was once a route along the Silk Road. The statue is just over one foot tall, with the face of a human and the body of a lion. According to an epitaph found inside the tomb, the body buried here was Liu Jun and his wife, who had lived sometime during the Tang Dynasty between 618 and 907. They didn't necessarily do anything of major historical importance, but the fact that their remains were guarded by a sphinx is extraordinary. According to Fan Jun, the head of the excavation team, Sphinx are highly unusual in Chinese tombs from this particular period. Nobody really knows where they got the inspiration for the Sphinx, or if it does indeed have ties to ancient Egypt. There were over 150 artifacts taken from the tomb, with only one of them being linked to the art of the Egyptians. So it must have been quite special. Egyptians and the Mayans Speaking of a bizarre connection with the Egyptians, here's something that will shock you. The one culture on Earth that has the most in common with ancient Egypt is undoubtedly the Maya. Not only did both of these cultures build some of the most impressive pyramid structures in the world, they also both used hieroglyphic writing systems that were shockingly similar. Yes, it's true that the Mayan pyramids were built thousands of years after the Egyptian pyramids, but that doesn't change the fact that the Maya never met the Egyptians and still found a way to copy them from across the ocean. To give you a rough timeline, the Egyptian pyramids were built 2,000 years before the ones found in Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. But what about the hieroglyphics? It seems unbelievable that two cultures separated by so much time and distance would come up with almost the same system of writing, yet it's true. The Egyptians and the Mayans used special symbols to convey thought and meaning. The Egyptian hieroglyphics were significantly more intricate, found on everything from pieces of jewelry to shards of pottery. Mayan hieroglyphics were mostly carved in stone and are considered more basic and primitive. Still, it's the core nature of the writing itself that counts. Even separated by time and space, the Mayans managed to follow in the footprints of the Egyptians. But first, want to give a big shout out to Jeff Soltis. I'm so glad you're enjoying the animations. And to Chris Crow. Thanks so much for supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Greek and Roman Gods you may have noticed there are some serious similarities between the Roman gods and the Greek gods. This cultural coincidence is actually more of the Romans absorbing the Greek pantheon. For example, the Greeks had Zeus and the Romans turned Zeus into Jupiter. Both were the king of the gods and wielded magical lightning bolts. The goddess of marriage in Greece was Hera and in Rome it was Juno. 
The Romans had Diana for the goddess of hunting and the Greeks had Artemis. But how did this happen? As you can tell, this is much more than just a coincidence. The Romans didn't just incorporate Greek beliefs, they stole them and then renamed them. The story of how this happened starts in 146 BC. The Romans invaded Greece at a time when they hadn't really developed their own gods yet. The Romans were acutely aware that trying to conquer Greece and keep it conquered would be infinitely more difficult if they tried to impose their own gods on them. So the Romans simply adopted the Greeks' beliefs and then let their gods and deities mingle with their own. But even before the Romans invaded Greece, they were both stealing gods from other ancient cultures. Rome took Isis from the Egyptians and renamed her Magma Mater. Even Greece stole the Hittite god Apollyunas and renamed him Apollo. The list goes on and on. Pine cones. Pine cones have been used by more ancient civilizations than you can ever imagine. They were considered symbols of fertility by the Assyrians, the Romans, the Greeks, and even the Christians. It's one of the most prevalent symbols anywhere in ancient cultures. The staff of Osiris has a pine cone at the top. Hindu gods are usually shown holding pine cones in their hands, and Assyrian carvings from over 3,000 years ago depict pine cones being used as fertilizer for the tree of life. It also goes to the other side of the world, with statues uncovered in places like Mexico depicting pine cones. So what's the deal with the pine cone? Experts theorize that the pine cone is associated with the pineal gland, or what some refer to as the third eye. But it goes even deeper than that, with multiple ancient cultures associating pine cones with eternal life. The Aztec god of corn, Chico Mecoat, is seen in statues holding the pine cone and the evergreen leaf as symbols of agricultural life. But it's a bit different with the ancient Celts and Romans who thought of pine cones as fertility symbols. Celts used to put pine cone fertility charms under their pillows at night, and Romans gave them as offerings to Venus, the goddess of love. The weird thing is that nobody knows why so many ancient cultures adored the pine cone. It's a total mystery that doesn't have much hope of ever being solved. The Sumerian Birdman The Sumerian Birdman is a strange phenomenon that suggests the ancient Sumerians had a presence in South America. Sculptures and carvings of a Sumerian god named Oans, an amphibious being who rose from the ocean to teach mankind cosmic wisdom, are ripe throughout much of ancient Mesopotamia. But they've also been found in Ecuador, just a little different. The Sumerian carvings show a god walking upright, one arm bent in front of his face, holding a mysterious handbag in the other. Carvings uncovered in Ecuador show the exact same thing. The only difference is, instead of having the face of a man and the head of a fish, the carvings found in Ecuador show a being with the head of an eagle. But the position is exactly the same, with the left hand clutching a mysterious bag and the right hand bent in front of the face. They could be exact copies of each other if not for the difference in heads. Now things get even stranger as we take a look at ancient Assyria. An identical figure as the one seen in Ecuador was discovered at the ancient palace of Sargon of Akkad. This particular statue appears to be holding a piece of maize, corn that was grown by the Maya and not even known about by the rest of the world until the 1400s. The obvious connection here is that the old kingdoms of Mesopotamia were in direct contact with the Mesoamerican cultures of South America and Central America thousands of years before the Maya even existed. How this is possible is a complete mystery. Ancient Basketball One of the most bizarre cultural similarities that we share today with the ancient Maya of yesterday is basketball. What a lot of people don't know is that the ancient Maya love playing ball games. A construction crew working in the Yucatan recently stumbled upon one of these ancient ball courts near the Technological University in Merida. Archaeologists were called to the scene and were shocked when they realized they were standing in a ball court where the Maya played a very primitive version of basketball that involved human sacrifice. The game was called Tlachtli, and it was played as far back as the Olmec and as recently as the Aztec. The point of the game was to throw a ball through a hoop at either end of a court. If that sounds familiar, it's because that's the point of basketball. The only difference with the Maya game is that they were not allowed to use their hands. They had to kick the ball through the extremely narrow hole in the stone hoop. This made it an incredibly difficult game. And to make things even harder, the losers of the game sometimes had their heads chopped off. Nobody knows for sure if this was the original inspiration for the game of basketball played today, 
but it is a pretty big coincidence that the Maya and Aztec played a game almost identical to our very own basketball. Ancient Cannabis As it turns out, ancient cultures from all over the world had one specific plant that they really enjoyed smoking. This is the cannabis plant, the one that is still extremely popular and very controversial to this day. In ancient Egypt, cannabis was used to treat a wide variety of ailments, things like glaucoma and feminine health, as well as pain management in general. The use of cannabis has been described in ancient Egyptian texts going by the name Shemshemet. This stuff was also used in funeral rituals in ancient Egypt and during the mummification process. Archaeologists were shocked when they discovered cannabis pollen on the mummified remains of Ramses the Great, the famous pharaoh who died in 1213 BC. Even more shocking is that the highest concentration of THC, the chemical in cannabis that causes a person to become intoxicated, was found inside the lungs. This suggests it was smoked. Scientists also found nicotine and cocaine along with the THC, hinting that the Egyptians partied pretty hard. But it wasn't only the Egyptians who smoked the stuff. Evidence of cannabis use has been found in China, Israel, Greece, India, Rome, and all throughout North America and South America. In ancient times, cannabis was one of the most popular plants grown and smoked by just about everyone. Head on a spike. Construction workers got the shock of a lifetime in Sweden when they found some skulls in a peat bog that had been smashed. But it wasn't recent. The bones date back to the Stone Age, and there was a lot more to this disturbing discovery than meets the eye. When a new railway line was to be constructed for freight trains moving through the area, construction workers uncovered the grisly remains and called in the archaeologists. They have now turned up not only smashed heads, but heads on skewers, and also fragments from animals and tools made from bone and horn. The human heads found skewered on some poles in a pile of rocks was kind of reminiscent of Ivan the Terrible. But 8,000 years ago, this place used to be a pond, and over time, the pond turned into a peat marsh. Frederick Hallgreen, the project leader for the excavation, said all signs point to some kind of strange ritual activity going on here with the Stone Age people. These skulls were detached from the bodies, put on spikes, and then buried with great care. Archaeologists found the skulls of 10 people in the boggy sediment, which marks the first evidence of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers mounting human skulls on stakes. Some of these skulls show signs of trauma, but then the injuries showed signs of healing. After they had gotten hit in the head, someone had taken care of them, but how their heads ended up on stakes is unclear. Swedish forensic scientists are working on reconstructing the faces and clothing of some of these people to see what they might have looked like so long ago. Even stranger is that the bodies were buried underneath a burial mound, which they didn't really use in Sweden until way later in the Iron Age, then only until the end of the Viking era. Nobody can understand why these Stone Age citizens, who had likely been hunters and gatherers, had gone through all the trouble of creating complex burial mounds and then go and impale some heads on some poles. It's all very confusing. Aztec slaughter. Archaeologists working in Mexico have recovered the ghoulish remains of Spaniards murdered by the Aztecs. The story is one of the most brutal, where both sides committed horrible crimes. The Aztecs captured a convoy of Spaniards traveling with a group of several hundred indigenous allies. The Aztecs captured the entire convoy and then cannibalized them, literally gnawing on the flesh of the Spanish invaders and their treacherous allies. In response, Hernán Cortés massacred a group of Aztec women and children. This isn't just a story either, as it's backed up by archaeological evidence. Researchers have discovered proof that over the course of eight months, the Spanish and their allies were offered as sacrifices to the Aztec gods at the city of Tecoaque. Archaeologists have found the remains of male and female prisoners who were strung up on racks, had their heads cut off, and made part of Aztec skull towers. Bone analysis even showed that some of these Spanish women had been sacrificed while pregnant. As the Aztecs made sacrifices to their bloodthirsty gods, the Catholic Spaniards looked upon this as an offense against God himself and vowed to defeat these people once and for all. Viking Slave Graves A group of Viking graves recently discovered in Norway has given researchers a gruesome look into how these seafaring warriors used to treat their slaves. The graves belonged to slaves who had been beheaded and then buried with their masters. 
Approximately 10 ancient people were discovered in multiple graves, with either two or three bodies sharing a single plot. Analysis of the human remains has shown that the people who were buried without their heads had eaten a very different diet from those who weren't decapitated. Elise Nauman from the University of Oslo says that the beheaded people were slaves offered as grave gifts to be buried alongside prominent members of society. This explains why the diets were so different. Now for the ugly part that nobody wants to talk about. The Vikings are often admired for being fierce raiders from between around the year 700 to 1200. But the truth is that they were also vicious killers who often stole people from the places they raided and kept them as slaves. That's why everyone was so afraid of them. They're cool if they're on your side. If you're a monk living in some monastery on the cliff watching them come towards you, then you wouldn't be so excited to see them. The other side of the truth is that Vikings weren't actually just barbarians who spent all their time plundering. Most of them were ordinary farmers who relied on the slaves brought back by their warriors to keep their agricultural gears turning. And yes, the Vikings treated their slaves like absolute garbage. Thanks to these new burials, now we know that they even sacrificed slaves and had them buried with their masters to assist them beyond death. Stake through the heart. The skeleton of a vampire has been discovered in Bulgaria with a stake driven right through its heart. The skeleton was found in the ruins of an ancient city by a local Bulgarian archaeologist. The dead person died sometime in his 40s or 50s and had gotten a metal stake bashed through his chest, probably to prevent him from rising from the dead. Even if this guy wasn't really a vampire who feasted on human flesh, the locals most certainly thought he was. It was common practice in medieval times to drive a metal spike through a corpse to stop it from waking up later and seeking revenge on the living. This most recent creepy discovery was made by Professor Nikolai Ovcharov in the ruins of Perperikon. The city itself was discovered around 20 years ago and was originally inhabited 7,000 years ago in 5000 BC. The city was once home to the famous Temple of Dionysus, dedicated to the Greek god of wine and fertility. But the city was also home to several impressive fortresses, a large sanctuary, and multiple dead vampires. Other than just having the stake driven through his heart, this guy also had his left leg amputated below the knee and placed beside his body. There were two other graves like this discovered in Bulgaria in 2012 and 2013 though they were at a different site and not at all related. As of right now, researchers have found roughly 100 vampire skeletons throughout Bulgaria, making ancient Bulgaria a whole lot more paranormal than the Transylvanian region of Romania to the north. It's shout out time! I wanted to give a big shout out to Tina Ellis and Todd Jeffrey. Hope this video doesn't creep you out too much right before you go to bed. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Mummy Lake Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado is home to the most fascinating ancient city anywhere in the United States of America. This place was lived in 1,000 years ago by the ancestral Puebloans, centuries before Christopher Columbus ever landed. They built their city into the wall of a great cliff, carving their houses out of the stone and then vanishing mysteriously without leaving a trace. But a new discovery in the Mesa Verde Park has nothing to do with the city itself, but rather a lake that may have had a scary association with ancient rituals. It's called Mummy Lake, and it's a circular pit that archaeologists used to think was a water reservoir for the people living in the city. It was not held to hold water, but rituals. More recent studies of the lake revealed that what people used to think were canals were actually ancient footpaths that led to the lake from a few key religious structures, a shrine house and a cliff palace. Between the years 900 and 1200, the locals may have been using the lake in their religious ceremonies. It could have been used as a depository for the dead, or perhaps where sacrifices were offered to the gods. Maybe even a ball court. Scientists don't know exactly what it was used for, but it definitely held great value to the Puebloans. Ancient Brain Surgery A case of prehistoric surgery dating back 5,000 years has shocked scientists. The discovery came during excavations near a small village in Crimea. Anthropologists working with the Institute of Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences uncovered the skull of a man who had undergone cranial surgery. At the site of the excavations, 18 burials were discovered from between the Bronze Age and the time that the Scythians ruled the region. The victim of the surgery was among these remains and was in his 20s when he died. 
According to the researchers, the surgeon who had operated on him did so with shocking precision. The surgeon scraped a huge area of bone away from the rest of the skull, leaving a thin layer less than one millimeter thick. Even more amazing is that the surgeon had done this using stone instruments. Imagine getting brain surgery and the doctors are using stone tools. This type of operation is known as a trepanation and it probably killed him. The bone surface showed no signs of any healing, meaning the man probably died in the days following the surgery. The surgery had likely been an attempt to relieve serious headaches or cure some other sort of affliction that remains unknown. Adidas Boots Mummy An ancient mummy was discovered with a pair of very old boots, dated back over 1,000 years. This is one of the stranger discoveries that's been made in recent times. The mummy was actually a Mongolian seamstress who was buried with four changes of clothing, a professional sewing kit, the head of a horse, and the head of a ram. She was also discovered wearing a fine pair of boots that have been compared to modern Adidas shoes. They're red and stripy, they're actually quite fashionable despite their age, and they wouldn't even look that out of place on someone's feet today. Archaeologists have no way of knowing exactly who this woman was during her life, but she was probably the ancient equivalent of a high-end fashion designer. She also suffered a brutal death. Scientists discovered a significant head injury that may have killed her. It seems that sometime during the 10th century, deep in the Altai Mountains of Mongolia, the seamstress was hit in the skull with something and then buried. She may have fallen down and hit her head on a rock, or somebody might have bludgeoned her to death and then tried to steal her wares. There's no way of knowing for sure. What we do know is that she was such a valued member of society that when her corpse was found, she was given an extremely elaborate burial. North York Skeletons A collection of human skeletons found inside the dark and spooky caves of the North York Moors in the United Kingdom were likely the victims of an obscure ritual sacrifice more than 2,000 years ago. These human remains were first found in the early 19th century, with major excavations taking place in the 1950s. At the time, researchers knew the skeletons had experienced some sort of serious trauma. However, it wasn't until recently that a more detailed investigation was able to get done, at which point scientists realized one of the dead people had been scalped, and all of them had experienced significant trauma. The caves in North York were occupied beginning about 4,500 years ago, with humans finally moving out of the cave sometime after the Roman occupation of Britain in the 5th century AD. We really did love living in our caves. The skeletons, in terms of their injuries, had been pretty badly mutilated. Researchers discovered trauma in the jawbone of one skull, suggesting he had been bashed with a sharp instrument. In fact, signs of violence were found on all the skeletons. Cut marks along the top of the cranium suggest scalping. However, this kind of thing wasn't that popular in Britain and so it left archaeologists a little shaken and surprised because they don't know why the people were sacrificed or who would even have done such a thing, except maybe a group of witches. Bone Tools Scientists have discovered proof that a pre-Aztec civilization in Mexico used the bones of their dead relatives to fashion all kinds of everyday items, from buttons to combs, spatulas, and even everyday utensils. 5,000 bone fragments were taken from beneath the ancient city of Teotihuacan near Mexico City and analyzed. These were mostly femurs, shin bones, and human skulls. A large majority of them had been turned into household items. The people who lived at Teotihuacan before the Aztecs ever occupied the city removed the flesh and muscles from the bones using stone knives. They did this as quickly after death as possible, as the body needed to be fresh so that the bones were still strong. This civilization, who lived in Teotihuacan between 100 BC and 650 AD, also practiced human sacrifice, of course. They had no fear of death, even burying their own loved ones underneath the foundations of their houses after cutting them apart and turning their bones into things like knives, forks, and spoons. Ancient Bear Skull A rather spooky bear skull dated to be 35,000 years old may just be the first solid evidence of humans hunting down cave bears and eating them. The giant skull was found during a Siberian cave excavation by Russian paleontologists. When they examined the bear's skull, they identified a small hole at the back that they say may have been the result of a spear. An early human from the Pleistocene era may have snuck up and stabbed the bear in the head while it was asleep. This makes sense too, seeing as stealth would really be the only way an ancient human could take down a monstrous cave bear. 
probably while it was hibernating. Cave bears are extinct now, but used to live in the caverns and caves of northern Eurasia. Some scientists say they were hunted to extinction over a period of about 5,000 years by the earliest Homo sapien hunters who moved into the region. This was a pretty scary time in history, with humans living in dark, damp caves and needing to ambush bears as they slept just to survive. But the hole in the bear skull could also be proof of something a little darker than just survival. According to the Smithsonian, the hole in the skull may have been made after the bear was already dead, so that the cave people could use the beast's head in some type of cave ritual. Uxmal Uxmal was once a thriving Maya city centered around a 131-foot-tall pyramid. It was a Mesoamerican steppe pyramid known as the Pyramid of the Magician. It was once one of the largest cities on the Yucatan Peninsula and was home to around 25,000 people at its peak. Although nobody knows when the Maya first settled in Uxmal, the settlement flourished between 600 and 1000 AD, with a major building period starting around the year 700. Construction on the Pyramid of the Magician began during the 6th century, and the structure was continuously expanded over the next 400 years. It was built in the Puk architectural style, which is characterized by a plain bottom and ornate upper levels. With richer soil than the surrounding areas and more rainfall than the region sees today, the people of Uxmal enjoyed agriculturally favorable conditions. It was also rich in raw materials that were used for building the city's magnificent structures, including a wall that protected the people from outsiders. Uxmal ceased to be a political stronghold around 950 AD, according to some scholars, and it was ultimately abandoned for reasons that remain unclear to this day. It survived longer than cities to the south, which had started to fall the previous century. Restoration began on the ruins at Uxmal during the 19th century, and efforts to maintain the structural integrity of its buildings are ongoing. Ostia Antica Fifteen miles south of Rome, there is a lesser-known ancient harbor city called Ostia Antica. Situated at the mouth of the Tiber River, it functioned as ancient Rome's seaport. An inscription claims that Ostia Antica was built during the 7th century BC. Known for its remarkably preserved state, the site contains a castrum, or a military camp, dating back to the 3rd century BC, as well as a temple dedicated to Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, known as the Capitolium. During the 1st century BC, Ostia saw fighting amid a series of civil wars between Gaius Marius and Sulla. Marius attacked the city in 87 BC, effectively cutting it off from trade with Rome. Then, in 68 BC, Ostia was plundered by pirates, who set the port on fire, destroyed the city's war fleet, and captured two of its prominent politicians. Pompey the Great, a top Roman general and statesman, raised an army and defeated the pirates within a year. Following the destruction, Ostia was rebuilt and fortified with protective walls. The city expanded throughout the 1st century AD under Tiberius, who ordered the construction of a forum and a new harbor. Ostia became so big, it occupied 173 acres within its walls. During the 4th century, construction spilled outside the walls to the south of the city. Discoveries are still being made at Ostia. In 2008, archaeologists discovered the remains of the widest canal the Romans ever built, measuring 300 feet across. More ruins were discovered in 2014. And archaeologists have also found public latrines, which had several open seats, showing that going to the bathroom was not only something the Romans were unashamed of, but quite possibly a social activity. Ostia had public baths, a large theater, several taverns and inns, and even a firefighting service. It's also home to Europe's oldest known synagogue. Brach of Gurness Sometime between 500 and 200 BC, people began settling on the northeastern coast of mainland Orkney, an island in the Scottish Orkney archipelago. The people here built formidable structures during the Iron Age, called a brach, which was a walled structure like a fortress. There are hundreds of these brachs, and they were often surrounded by villages. The brach of Gurness is perhaps one of the most impressive, and they were used as defensive structures and also to show off. The community's chief and his family probably lived in the tower. With walls measuring up to 13 and a half feet thick, it kept raiders at bay and protected everyone inside, including cattle that might get stolen. 
It was equipped with a central hearth, stone-built cupboards lining the wall, stairs leading to the upper floors, and a sunken water basin, which may have been a well for drinking or used in rituals. An amphora dating back to the first century that was found at the site lends credibility to historical records claiming that a king of Orkney submitted to Emperor Claudius in 43 AD. The village was abandoned sometime after 100 AD and thereafter served as a single farm until the 8th century. The last known activity to happen there was the burial of a Viking woman with some grave goods during the 9th century. Today, the Brach is in ruins and is surrounded by the remains of multiple small stone dwellings that once housed the community's residents. It's the best preserved Brach village and still contains traces of the town's main street connecting the outer entrance to the Brach. It is an amazing place to visit, so I've heard, and it helps give us a glimpse into what life was like during the Iron Age. Volubilis Located in north-central Morocco, the ancient Berber city of Volubilis was established during the 3rd century BC and was the ancient capital of the Kingdom of Mauritania. It grew considerably after the Romans conquered it in 40 AD and eventually spanned 100 acres. The city was surrounded by 1.6 miles of walls and saw its biggest growth during the 2nd century. During this time, numerous public buildings popped up, including a temple, basilica, and triumphal arch. The Berbers recaptured Volubilis during the 3rd century, and it thereafter fluctuated between Christian and Muslim cultures. From the 8th to the 11th centuries, the city served as the capital of the Idrisid dynasty, but the rulers abandoned the site, and most of the population followed. Volubilis was subsequently forgotten. During the mid-18th century, the ruins were damaged by an earthquake. The site was identified as Volubilis during the late 19th century, and by then it had been heavily looted and vandalized. Excavations uncovered mosaics, homes, the Arch of Caracalla, and public buildings. Today, Volubilis is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been partially restored. Ciudad Perdida Nestled deep in the tropical forests of Colombia's Sierra Nevada region, the ruins of La Ciudad Perdida, or the Lost City, are 650 years older than the famed Machu Picchu site in Peru. The ancient settlement was built by indigenous people around the year 800 and was massive for its time, with somewhere from 2,000 to 8,000 residents at its peak. In addition to its impressive size, Ciudad Perdida is also an incredible feat of engineering since its builders constructed the city along a steep mountain ridge almost a mile above sea level. The elaborate network of drainage systems and stone bridges are still visible today, standing as a testament to the skill of Ciudad Perdida's builders. Experts believe that the Tairona people lived there until the 16th century, when they abandoned the site amid the arrival of Spanish conquistadors. The indigenous people who live in the region never forgot about the site, which they called the Yuna. They purposely kept its location a secret to prevent looting and vandalism by outsiders. Ciudad Perdida only became known to the rest of the world in the 1970s when it was rediscovered. The ruins are now open to the public and are only accessible via a 27-mile hike through challenging terrain in the sweltering heat. Hajar Im Found on the Mediterranean island of Malta, Hajar Im is a megalithic temple complex and one of the world's oldest known religious sites. It's even older than Stonehenge, dating back to sometime between 3600 and 3200 BC. The site consists of a central building made up of C-shaped apses and two or more other structures. They were built with massive limestone blocks with the largest measuring 17 feet high and weighing as much as 22 tons. Thick-bodied figurines, a phallic-shaped megalith, and other evidence found at the site indicates that it may have been used for fertility rituals. An altar with a concave top and the presence of animal bones further suggests that animal sacrifices may have been performed at Hajar Im. There are no human burials at the site and no human bones have ever been found there. Maltese historian Giovanni Francesco wrote during the 17th century that the structures here prove that Malta's first inhabitants were a race of giants. People from Gozo in Malta believed that an extinct race of giants was responsible for building the impressive temples. When the temples were abandoned around 2500 BC, they were not rediscovered until the 19th century. Excavations began, but little has been done to restore the site. Made from soft limestone, the structures have suffered from severe weathering and are slowly disintegrating. Zuga 
The best preserved Roman town in Africa can be found at Duga in northern Tunisia. Founded in the 6th century BC on the site of the former Numidian capital of Thugga, the settlement was on a plateau overlooking the surrounding plains, giving its inhabitants an advantage over any suspicious outsiders. The discovery of Bronze Age burial structures called dolmens suggests that the site was occupied as early as 2000 BC. However, most of the ruins are from the Roman era, including a theater that held as many as 3,500 people, a chariot racing circus, mosaic floors, cobblestone streets, a group toilet, two triumphal arches, and several baths dated to around 300 AD. The settlement contains 20 temples, which is a lot for a population that peaked at around 5,000. Because of this, researchers initially believed that Duga was a significant religious site, but they later determined that wealthy residents built the temples as a testament to their good fortune. The most famous temple is the Capitol, which was built during the second century as a dedication to the gods Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, known as Rome's protective triad. Based on the site's scant evidence of Christianity, it appears as though Duga experienced an early decline during the 4th century. What exactly happened is unknown. Pisac Located in the sacred valley of the Incas in what is now Peru, the Pisac ruins are among the country's most intact archaeological sites. Built on a mountain overlooking the modern-day town of Pisac and the Urubamba River, the ancient settlement contains evidence of occupation even before the Incas arrived. Vessels from the Lucre and Kilki pottery cultures have been found in the area, where the first inhabitants lived on a hillside and raised their crops on terraces. Experts believe that the Inca Empire conquered the site around 1440. Under Emperor Pachacuti, they built a settlement which functioned as a citadel, observatory, and religious site. It supported a small population and was a royal retreat for the Emperor's Panaca, or family and descendants. Situated far from the Inca capital of Cusco, the settlement allowed Inca nobility to relax with relatively little fear of invading enemies. But the complex was not immune to destruction, and during the early 1530s it was destroyed by Francisco Pizarro and the Spanish conquistadors. Forty years later, during the 1570s, the modern-day town of Pisac was built in the valley below. Pisac was first described in modern literature in the late 19th century, when the U.S. commissioner to Peru visited and recorded a detailed account of the Inca ruins. The 65-acre complex sits as high as 11,529 feet above sea level in some parts. This lesser-known, off-the-beaten-path tourist destination offers visitors a fascinating look into the pre-Columbian life of indigenous South Americans. Pergue Settled around 1500 BC by the Hittites, Pergue, also called Perga, was strategically situated where two rivers converge in modern-day Turkey's Antalya province, near the Mediterranean coast. Over the next 1,000 years, it changed hands multiple times between the Greeks, Persians, Athenians, and others. Alexander the Great passed through the area in 333 BC and took control of the city, which didn't put up much of a fight. In 133 BC, Perge was bequeathed to the Romans. According to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul visited Perge twice during his first missionary journey. During the first five centuries of the Common Era, formerly called the Christian Era, after serving as a seat of worship for the Greek goddess Artemis, the city became a flourishing epicenter of Christianity. A devastating earthquake prompted Perge's residents to flee during the 11th century, and it's been deserted ever since. The Turkish government began excavations and renovations in 1946, revealing an array of stunning structures including a theater, stadium, palace, two churches, a fountain, aqueducts, the Temple of Artemis, and more. Pula Pula is a seafront city situated at the southern tip of Croatia's Istrian Peninsula. Owing to its strategic location, it's been occupied, destroyed, and rebuilt multiple times. An Illyrian tribe was the first to settle the area around 3,000 years ago, with Pula functioning as a fortified hill town. During the first century, the Romans conquered the city and built temples, a theater, arches, villas, an arena, and a forum. You know, like they always do. Many of these structures remain in place today. One of Pula's most iconic structures is the Triumphal Arch of Sergius, which was built to commemorate members of the local Sergius family. Even more famous is the city's arena. Construction began during the reign of Augustus, and the arena was finished in the late 1st century AD by Emperor Vespasian. It remains mostly intact, 
boasting 100-foot walls and four towers that gave guests access to the building's upper tiers. As many as 20,000 spectators gathered there at a time to watch gladiator fights. A canopy protected them from the rain, while a gutter running along the top of the structure channeled rainwater from the building. During the Middle Ages, the stone seats were harvested for other construction projects, but the arena is equipped with wooden seats and hosts concerts during the summer. Archaeological work at Pula is ongoing, but a lack of maintenance funds in recent years has threatened to close down parts of the site, and the rare glimpse into the past that the city offers might soon be gone. Arca Ferrata Archaeologists in Spain recently hit the jackpot when they found the remains of a wooden safe in a Roman villa. Known as an Arca Ferrata, it is an actual ark, you know, like the Ark of the Covenant. Rich people in Roman times would use them to keep their valuables safe, just like you would today. These types of chests were typically used for storing clothes, jewelry, money, important documents, and other objects of monetary and sentimental value. To prevent the boxes from being stolen, families nailed them to the walls of their homes. This Arc Ferrata is a large four-legged wooden chest covered in gold, bronze, and iron measuring 3.1 by 2.9 feet, and it's adorned with many ancient symbols, including laurel branches, a horn of plenty, a Roman dish called a patera, a Greek sun hat called a patasso, and of course Greek and Roman deities, including Cupid, Apollo, and Mercury. The discovery of this box came as quite the surprise because there are not many artifacts like this preserved from the Roman Empire, with just only four others found in Spain and most of the rest in Pompeii. The Ark was excavated from the ruins of a luxurious villa. It appears as though the villa caught fire, forcing its occupants to flee. Sadly, part of the house collapsed onto the box and it was found in pretty bad shape. However, archaeologists are pretty confident they can restore it and are slowly working little by little to bring it back to its former glory. Lost Monastery Historical records mentioned the presence of an Anglo-Saxon monastery in Berkshire, England that was run by a powerful Mercian queen. But until recently, nobody knew where it was. Historians knew Queen Swynethrith became this monastery's abbess after her husband, King Offa, died in 796 AD. As the wife of the man who ruled over the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia, she was one of the most powerful women of her time. The site was part of a larger network of monasteries along the Thames, which prospered at a time when the river was part of an important trade route. Archaeologists from the University of Reading finally discovered and excavated the monastery last summer, 2021. They located it on a gravel island that serves as the grounds of the Holy Trinity Church in the village of Cookham. At the site, the team found the remains of wooden buildings that once housed those who lived at the monastery. Another part of the site appears to have been used for metalworking. The team also discovered some of the former residents' personal belongings, including pottery, cooking vessels, clothing, and jewelry. Experts know very little about what life was like at the monastery, making the breakthrough discovery especially important. They plan to study the artifacts found at the site in hopes of gaining some insight into the daily lives of the people who lived here, and especially the life of one of the most powerful women of the early Middle Ages. The next step is trying to locate her final resting place. Embracing Lovers While excavating an ancient cemetery in northern China's Shangqi province last year, archaeologists discovered the well-preserved skeletons of two lovers embracing. The pair was found lying on their sides with their arms wrapped around one another and the woman's face buried into the man's shoulder. It's the first time a couple has been found buried like this in ancient China. According to a recently published report, the couple most likely lived during the Northern Wei Dynasty that occupied much of the country's northern and central regions and lasted from 386 to 534 AD. Based on signs of trauma on the male skeleton, the paper speculates that the man passed away first and that the woman may have committed suicide so she could be laid to rest with him. It's also possible that they died together in some sort of conflict or from an illness. People living under the Northern Wei Dynasty increasingly valued the concept of an afterlife as Buddhism became more popular, according to study co-author Chun Zheng. This could explain why the couple was positioned the way they were, since ideals about love were constantly changing, and perhaps this couple believed they were going to be together in the afterlife. Researchers were intrigued to find a simple metal ring on the woman's left hand. While experts typically hesitate to associate discoveries like this with love and marriage, 
The overall context of the grave suggests that perhaps the jewelry symbolized the pair's commitment to each other. Material displays of love are rarely found in ancient burials, making the discovery of the intertwined lovers especially surprising. Bronze Age Treasure A farmer in Poland recently uncovered some ancient treasure in his field. He found an entire collection of some mysterious ancient objects while removing some rocks. So he stopped his work and contacted local experts who came and excavated the site. The artifacts include bronze daggers, an axe, a chisel, a hatchet, and several ornamented staffs called scepters. It turns out that they belong to the enigmatic Unetice culture of Central Europe. This culture was around from roughly 2300 to 1800 BC, near the beginning of the region's Bronze Age. Around 1400 archaeological sites from various subgroups have been found in the Czech Republic, Poland, Germany, Austria, and Ukraine. Researchers said it's extremely rare to find any artifacts from these ancient people, let alone a whole collection of them together. These Bronze Age people may have hidden this collection of artifacts during times of war, and someone was hoping to come back for it later. This was not the only recent surprising archaeological discovery in the region either. Earlier this year, nearby residents found a bronze bracelet and notified local authorities. Archaeologists traveled to the site and unearthed hundreds of items, including bronze ornaments, jewelry, parts of a horse harness, and a broken vessel. The variety and amount of objects made the find especially valuable. These artifacts were traced to the Lusatian culture, which existed from 1300 BC to 500 BC during the Late Bronze and Early Iron Ages. Who knows what other treasures from little-known cultures might be popping up soon. Ancient Coin Hoard When one family decided to go camping at Habonim Beach in northern Israel recently, they probably didn't expect to stumble upon any archaeological artifacts. To their surprise, they found a 13-pound mass of ancient coins that had become stuck together after sitting in the water for centuries. Yotam Dahan, who discovered the coins, posted photos of the fascinating find on social media. The post caught the attention of staff members from the Israel Antiquities Authority, who contacted Dahan and asked him to lead them to the exact site where he found the coins. Luckily, he was able to, and an expert dated the clumped currency to the 4th century. Yaakov Sharvit, who heads the IAA's Marine Archaeology Department, told the Jerusalem Post that the coins may have come from an ancient ship that was sailing in the Mediterranean. He further explained that it was sadly common for vessels and their cargo to wash ashore, and that there are many archaeological sites along the beach. Whoever lost their huge coin stash was probably not very happy about it, and maybe got in big trouble. Tahan turned the coins over and received a certificate of appreciation in return. Graves in Poland As Germany faced imminent defeat in 1945 toward the end of World War II, Nazis scrambled to hide evidence of their war crimes. Hundreds of prisoners were marched into the woods of northern Poland and shot to death at close range. Their remains were buried in shallow mass graves. There were a few witnesses of these killings and another massacre that had occurred several years earlier in 1939. But while the locals knew this tragedy had occurred, no one really knew where this had happened, and a lot of people kept quiet. Finally, excavations near a small village yielded physical evidence of the atrocities. In addition to finding human bones, archaeologists unearthed jewelry, cigarette lighters, bullet casings, and more. Many things like this occurred in the forests, but these sites are rarely studied out of respect for Jewish beliefs that prohibit disturbing human remains. The creepy discoveries were made in an area nicknamed Death Valley, where Nazis murdered hundreds of priests, intellectuals, disabled people, and Jewish families. While people have long known about the horrific acts, the study yielded rare archaeological insight into this dark chapter in history. Personal effects found at the site have helped to identify many of the victims, but it's unlikely that every person will be identified due to the sheer number of remains. Experts are performing DNA tests in an effort to name more victims and bring closure to their surviving relatives. White-haired skeleton at Pompeii Archaeologists working at Pompeii recently discovered the exceptionally well-preserved skeleton of a wealthy former slave named Marcus Venerius Secundio. The remains are so intact, they contain the man's white hair, a portion of his ear, and clothing fragments. After being freed from slavery, Secundio became a priest and helped stage performances in Greek, according to an inscription found on his tomb. He achieved a high social standing and died at around 60 years old, 
several decades before Mount Vesuvius erupted and encased the ancient city in ash. In an official statement, Pompeii Archaeological Park Director Gabriel Zucktriegel explained that the burial provides the first solid evidence of the Greek language being used alongside Latin. He further states that the findings reflect the city's lively and open cultural climate. Secundio's body remained in its remarkable state because his tomb was hermetically sealed. The burial is surprising because at the time, adults were usually cremated. Only small children were typically buried. Alongside the man's body, the team found two urns that were used for holding cremated human remains. One bears the inscription Novia Amabilis, which means kind wife. Experts are currently working to determine if Secundio's remains were deliberately preserved. They plan to analyze the fabric fragments for traces of embalming chemicals. In the meantime, park staff are considering the possibility of making the area the tomb was found in accessible to the public. Rare Fighting Blade While searching for a lost battlefield site in north-central Poland earlier this year, archaeologists unexpectedly discovered a rare Langsax long knife in nearly perfect condition. The blade was found in the Wodeki Landscape Park, where experts believe a battle may have occurred during the Polish-Pomeranian conflict of 1091 AD. But the knife likely had nothing to do with the skirmish. It appears to be a so-called loose find, according to an archaeologist who explained in a statement that there is no evidence that the artifact has a wider connection to its surroundings. He described the size of the blade as impressive, adding that it could easily measure up against double-edged swords from that period. So how did such a valuable ancient weapon end up here? Maybe someone dropped it? The weapon could date as far back as the 8th century, and it may be Norwegian, pointing toward possible Viking origins. The tip of the blade is slightly bent, but it otherwise contains no visible damage. The team plans to perform metallographic tests on the knife in hopes of learning more about it. Fireproof Shingles Colonial Williamsburg once consisted of 89 original buildings, including the Powder Magazine, an octagonal building that was built in 1715. It was originally built for storing gunpowder and firearms, and later functioned as a stable and then a church. In 1930, the structure was restored as part of the site's Living History Museum. Researchers long believed that the Powder Magazine was originally equipped with flammable wooden shingles, but they recently learned otherwise. While excavating near the building, a team led by archaeologist Jack Gary found several small clay roof tiles. The discovery, which happened just weeks into a three-month excavation project, highlights the fact that there's still a lot experts don't know about the former capital of Virginia. Speaking with the Virginia Gazette, Gary explained that the shingle warrants a major reinterpretation of the powder magazine. He hopes to find more fascinating artifacts throughout the remainder of the dig, which will help to paint a more accurate picture of the original building and any changes that need to be made to the restored version. Have any of you visited this site? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Body Modification People have been getting piercings and tattoos and practicing body modification for thousands of years. Gabon is a country located along the Atlantic coast of Central Africa. While excavating a cave filled with human remains, archaeologists found evidence that during ancient times, people practiced body modification techniques that were unique to the area. The team determined that the remains belonged to at least 28 people who lived during the 14th and 15th centuries. They were both male and female and varied in age. Their bodies were dropped or lowered into the cave along with valuable metal grave goods like axes and jewelry, indicating that the deceased were of high social ranking. The adult's incisor teeth had been removed earlier in their lives, drastically altering the shape of their face. This may have been done to identify them as belonging to a certain group, or of a high status. While dental modification was common in ancient Africa, this particular practice has never been seen before. Reaching the site is no easy task. Because the cave is only accessible through a hole in the ceiling, the team had no choice but to rappel 82 feet to the bottom. They plan to return for further investigation and hope to obtain DNA from the remains. The Size of Humans In a recent study, researchers measured and examined the body and brain size of 300 fossils from the Homo genus found in various places throughout the world. They analyzed the data in combination with a reconstruction of regional climates over the last million years and came to some surprising conclusions. It looks like the climate and the weather really impacted the size of early people. 
The research encompassed various species, including Neanderthals, Homo habilis, and other extinct members of the human family tree. Generally speaking, however, the Homo genus has demonstrated a trend of developing larger bodies and brains over time. But the team found that early people evolved to have larger bodies in colder regions. It's thought that a bigger size protects against frigid temperatures because bigger bodies lose less heat. Study leader Andrea Manica attributes these changes directly to climate and temperature. He cited living evidence of this in the fact that people who are native to warm regions tend to be smaller than those who live in colder climates. Brain size, on the other hand, seems to have nothing to do with climate. The researchers found that ancient humans with larger brains tended to live in habitats that lacked vegetation but were ecologically stable. Manica believes that people who lived in places like grasslands and open steppes may have developed bigger brains as a result of hunting large animals for food, which was an arguably complex task that demanded ample brain energy. The researchers did say that you shouldn't worry too much about the study to see how our bodies might change in the future. There's other things to worry about. Thanks for watching! Which discovery did you like the most? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!